Good evening. It is a pleasure to be here with you this evening. As Brother Brown mentioned beforehand, I uh, am a last-minute substitution. So uh, hopefully I uh, don't have too big a shoes to fill uh, in Brother Grantham. But um, I appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, we're going to study a portion of God's Word this evening. I hope that you'll take out your Bibles and that you will follow along with me, that uh, you will take and make application to your lives on the things that are said where they're necessary. And then I also ask, too, that uh, if I say something that is in air, you would be my friend. If you would bring that to my attention, uh, we'll make it right, uh, because not only do I want you to go to heaven, I want to be there, too. And so we're going to study God's word and, and, and look forward to hopefully being in heaven together one day. When uh, I was texting with Marcus about being here, um, just uh, about a week ago right now, I guess it was, and I knew that they, you were having a meeting, I knew that there were some titles and uh, some subjects that you wanted to focus on, and I said, well, I don't know if I can get a, a subject together, uh, you know, specific, in time and he said well just do whatever and he told me what your thoughts were and uh, I had already been working on a sermon along those lines so I'm going to change the topic just a little bit but we're going to uh, have the same thought in mind would like to ask before we get started as well uh, many of you know my grandfather uh, Leo Plyler he was here in a meeting with you uh, not too terribly long ago um, he's been in the hospital, he's out now, but uh, they did find uh, a mass on his kidney. And they did a biopsy on Monday, and he is to go to the doctor tomorrow to get the results of that biopsy. Um, so we solicit your prayers uh, for, for that. I want you to think for a moment this evening, how did you get here this evening? Well, you're probably saying, Atlanta, that's a foolish question. We, we drove here. We rode in a car. Well, that's what we did, too. But you could have walked. You could have ridden a bicycle. But nonetheless, you're here. As you were getting here, did you see any signs on the way on how to get here? Whether it be a stop sign, whether it be a speed limit sign, or directions. We came through some curvy back roads and it had um, some, uh, some signs. One of them said Lucille. And I said, I don't know that I've ever heard of Lucille, Alabama. But there is one. But nonetheless, there were signs on how to get here. Some of the old folks, like Brother Wes, may have called those guideposts. A guidepost. And that is what we're going to talk about this evening. We're going to talk about 10 divine guideposts leading to heaven. If you notice the passage that I have on the, the screen, there's Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. It says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and he will be with his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Brothers and sisters, if I left it right there tonight, and reading those two passages, those two verses, heaven is a place you ought to want to be. Because not only is there no more crying and mourning and weeping and pain and sorrow and tears, God, the creator of all things, will be there too. With whom we owe everything. And I can't help but think, as I was reading this passage and, and working on it, I couldn't help but think of, of some things that my family has been going through as of late. Many of you know that my mom has been dealing with breast cancer. 
Uh, she tomorrow uh, gets the results of her first bone scan since she fin finished surgery and chemotherapy. I can't help but think of watching my grandmother who died of Parkinson's disease slowly just waste away. And I think that in heaven there will be no more of those things. And we're here this evening because we want to go to heaven. And if you don't want to go to heaven, you're in the wrong place. And you need to get an attitude check. Because the alternative to heaven is not good. Well, what is a guidepost? A guidepost is not a term that we use often today. And you will find, if you uh, listen to me speak very much, I love definitions. <laughs> Because it gives us a common ground. We know where we, want, know where we are. There's not any ambiguity in what we're talking about. Well, a guidepost is a post with a sign giving directions for travelers, usually placed at a crossroad. Something that serves as a guide or an example, a principle or a guideline, and that's from freedictionary.com. Simple Google search will give you these. And then from dictionary.com, it says it's a noun, a post, usually mounted on the roadside or the intersection of two or more roads, bearing a sign for the guidance of travelers, anything serving as a guide or guideline. Brothers and sisters, here's our guidepost. And within it are many divine guideposts. We're only going to look at 10 this evening. And we're going to paint with a very broad brush. But as we will mention later on in our sermon, we'll talk about the details that God gives us and the, specific, the specificity of those things. Well, the first thing I want us to look at this evening is we have to know, number one, that Christ is the true prophet. And I'll have all of our passages on the overhead this morning, but I encourage you to, or this evening, I encourage you to follow with me along. I'll, I read from the English Standard Version most of the time, but I'll make reference to some other versions as we go through. But in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 22, it says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. I want to bring something out to your attention. Christ was a forethought. He was in God's plan from the beginning. All you have to do is turn to the Old Testament and read. And we all know that. Hundreds of prophecies of Christ. Hundreds of prophecies fulfilled in Christ. We know that he was the son of God. And then he was crucified for our sins. Again, the book of Acts in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. It says, let it be known to all of you to all people of Israel, that the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It reminds me of that short, simple song, Jesus, name above all names. Read Hebrews chapter 1, and it will tell you that Jesus is above all. Do we treat him like that in our lives? That guidepost to heaven. You see, what it does not mention either, that with Christ being the true prophet, you don't see the prophet Muhammad 
or the prophet Joseph Smith or Jeremiah Johnson or Ellen White or others that you may hear of. You don't find those names in God's word. But you do find Christ. That he was crucified on the cross for our sins. Along with Christ being the true prophet, we must hear and follow him. In Matthew chapter 17, in verse 5, it says, He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The English standard says, Listen to him. Some of the older versions say, Hear ye him. But do we listen to him intently? Do we do every command in God's word? In 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, it says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we were made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to you, more, more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. As, a, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Know that Christ is the true prophet. Know that there is no other way to salvation but through the words of Christ. But the second guidepost that we need to look at is to abide in me. In John chapter 15, if you'll turn to John chapter 15 beginning in verse 4, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you, cannot, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Brothers and sisters, we know what that means. But what does it mean to abide in something? The word abide is to accept or act in accordance with, to remain fixed or stable in a state. We cannot live without Christ. Without Christ, we will spend an eternity in hell. And that is not Landon Manning speaking. That is the word of God. In John chapter 14, beginning in verse 4, it says, And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We must abide in Christ, in his word. In John chapter 8, in verse 31, it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Do we accept? Do we act? Do we remain? Do we remain fixed and stable in the words of Christ? 
After all, we looked at the definition of the word abide. Do we abide in his word? Are we as Christians stable and fixed in his word? If not, we should be. If we're not, we need to look in the mirror and have some self-examination and fix the problem. Because we're getting off course if we're not. Again, in John chapter 15 and verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That third guidepost that we need to look at is we need to continue steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. All the way back into Acts chapter 2, we're very familiar with that chapter there in verse 42. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. What does that word devoted mean? It's a word that we use somewhat often. But it's very loving or loyal, given over to the display, study, or discussion of. Are we so devoted to the apostles' teaching? Are we so devoted to the the words of Christ that it is on display? Can people tell that we are Christians just by the way that we dress, by the way that we walk, by the way that we talk, by the way that we act? Do we study it? Are we not afraid to discuss it? Do we freely and openly discuss God's word? I was flipping through Facebook the other day, and I came upon a picture of several young ladies. I only knew one in the picture, knew that she was a Christian. They were at some theme park, but she was dressed differently. She didn't look like the others. She didn't have the short shorts. She had longer shorts. She was dressed modestly. We're different. And if the word is abiding in us, if we are continuing steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, then it's going to show. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. For by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Again, that word persist there. Continually, continue firmly or obstinately in an opinion or a course of action in spite of difficulty, opposition, or failure. Brothers and sisters, being a Christian will not always be easy. But if we're continuing steadfastly, we'll make it through. Our fourth guidepost that we'll look at this evening is follow the pattern of sound words. The American Standard Version uses the term hold the pattern. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, it says, They serve a copy, a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain." We must follow the details of the pattern. Now, at the onset of the sermon, I told you that we were painting with a very broad brush this evening. But I want you to think for just a moment. Think of the details that God gave Noah in the ark. 
Think of the details of the construction of the temple. Think of the details dealing with the Ark of the Covenant. Think of the details with priest and sacrifice. Sacrifice is. Think of the details in becoming a Christian. Think of the details in participating in the Lord's Supper. You see, God shows us all the details. He shows us the pattern. If we don't follow the pattern, we will not make it to heaven. We must follow the pattern of sound words. We need to make sure everything is in accordance with the pattern. The fifth guidepost that we'll look at is do all in the name of the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. We need to make sure that we are putting the Lord first in everything that we do, in everything that we say, in how we act, in what we wear, as I said earlier, people need to see Christ living in us. Why? Because that's what the guidepost says. That's the direction. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. You are serving the one who came to this earth, died on the cross for your sins. We need to work for the Lord and not for men. How many people today, even Christians, live for the world that show up on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings and maybe even Wednesday evenings, but the other days and the other times, they're living for the world. By the way they talk, the way they act, the way they dress. By not abiding in the Word. By not abiding in Christ. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. And we sang that song earlier, and that was not planned, but it is on the overhead, and you have gotten new songbook since the last time I was here. But if you will, pull your songbook out, and I want to look at that song one more time. Hopefully with a little bit different view now that we've read a few passages. It's number 626 in uh, this new songbook here. But it is so simple, it is so plain, and when we are looking at the passages in Colossians chapter 3 that we've just read, and then we look at the words to this song, it ought to make us examine ourselves. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do not in name of man or creed, do all in the name of the Lord. Be not deceived by worldly greed, do all in the name of the Lord. The Spirit says in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Till toil and labors here are done, do all in the name of the Lord. Dear Christian friends, if you'd be one, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name. Do all in the name of the Lord. In word or deed, as God decreed, do all in the name of the blessed Lord. My question to you is simply, do you? Do you do everything you do 
in the name of the Lord. Living as a Christian ought to live. Well, what does the guidepost say? And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's not Landon speaking. That's the word of God. Our sixth guidepost is in trust to faithful men. And I know you're thinking, well, Landon, we don't need to put our trust in men. Men will fail. But let's look at what the scriptures say. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 in the first two verses. It says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That word there, to entrust, means men who would not, under no temptation, betray the charge committed to them. If you're if you're thinking about that, let me, let, let's, let's think about what we do on a daily basis. Who are you around? Who is your family around? Are they around faithful men or people of the world? Who's going to get you to heaven? Who's going to hold you accountable? What about the church? Faithful members of the church. Are we around those people? Do we entrust in them? We read Titus chapter 2, and this was not planned either in our Bible reading. But I want to read this again. Titus chapter 2 in the first eight verses. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are not to be sober, are to be sober-minded dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young men to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that, so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. Probably if you have that open in your Bible, if you think over in Titus chapter 1, what do you have? You have the qualifications of elders. Do you want your children, your family members to be around those who are qualified to be elders? I do. Do you want your children? Do you want to be around? People described here in Titus chapter 2. I do. But let me ask you this. Are you one of these people? Are you one of these that people can entrust to be a faithful man or woman. How do you measure to the measuring stick of God's word? It's a humbling thought, isn't it? We need to entrust to faithful men. Our seventh guidepost is he will guide you into all the truth. In John chapter 16 and verse 13, it says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, verses 16 and 17, very common passage to us. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
Brothers and sisters, we've got a map right here. We've got a guidepost that leads us to heaven. Are we following it? And here's the, the, the problem that I see sometimes, brethren, is I see brothers and sisters in Christ that have the map, that have the guidepost, and they'll study it, and they'll look at it, and they'll talk about it. But they won't drive the car. And what I mean by that is they'll talk about it, they'll look at it, but they won't do it. They won't act on it. And whether it's you living as a Christian or becoming a Christian, act on God's word. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Let the word of God instruct us, encourage us, so that we all will make it to heaven. The eighth guidepost. Well, let's finish seven. Getting ahead of myself. Second Peter chapter one and verse twenty. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter fifteen and verse four, for whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. That's what I was speaking of just a moment ago. That encouragement and the instruction through the scriptures that we may have hope. But that eighth guidepost, practice these things. Philippians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Not just think about, but do. As I said a moment ago, we need to stop looking at the map and start driving the car. We need to be doers of God's word. We need to talk the talk and walk the walk of a Christian. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1, finally, then brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to to walk and to please God just as you are doing that you do so more and more that means we continue that we do it more and then we do it some more and then we do it some more we continue to grow no matter our age James chapter 1 and verse 22 but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. I'm afraid, brothers and sisters, that there are many times that we don't do. But sometimes we avoid the right thing to do. Have you ever been around a, a religious discussion? Hearing people talk about things that are not in accordance to the will of God. And you just stay quiet. I've done it. I'm guilty of it. 
but I'm going to do my best not to let it happen again. We don't know how we might save a lost soul just by saying and doing something small. Let me give you an example. Back in the days of AOL Instant Messenger, some of you remember that, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. I was in college with a young lady and we were discussing a, a project that we were working on together. And she said that she had to, to leave to go to practice for the baby dedication service at her church. And I simply typed in AOL Instant Messenger, where does the Bible talk about baptizing babies? And she said, I don't know. Let me ask my pastor. Well, she went and asked. She came back with more questions, and I gave her answers. And this went on for a while. And then she asked to go to services. Well, she did not live close to where I did, so I took her to the church at Oak Mountain. Called Brother Hato, and one of the elders said, heads up, this, this young lady's been studying the Bible. She's interested. I went with her that morning. I went back to where I was attending that night, but she went on her own. That young lady now is a faithful Christian. She has a faithful husband, faithful children, and she has taught all three of my boys in Bible class. Simply by doing something small, asking a question to make somebody think. But do we do that, or do we let those opportunities pass us by? We need to practice these things. We need to be the Christians that we ought to be. Our time is quickly fleeting away. The ninth guidepost is we're saved by obeying Christ. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. See, we're kind of making a little bit of a full circle now, aren't we? Talking, we talked about early on abiding in the Word. What does abiding in the Word get us? In James chapter 1 and verse 21, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save your soul. The implanted word of Christ. Acts chapter 11 and verse 14. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved and you and all your household. Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Do we notice these passages, the word we use, salvation? Salvation through obeying Christ. The final guidepost that we'll look at this evening is you must live faithfully unto death. In Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 10, it says, Do not fear 
what you were about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second Again in Revelation, skipping to chapter 14, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. In Psalm chapter 116 and verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. In James chapter 1 and verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. There are times in this life that it's going to be tough. It's going to be rough. But we must continue in the faith. There is no retirement for Christians. You know, Sir Ed Edmund Burke talks about for talking about for able to prevail. When good men do nothing. That's all that we need to do. But when good men do nothing, they're no longer good. I had a brother in Christ. I first became a Christian. He was an, an older man, gray hair. And after I became a Christian, I remember these words very, very strong to me. He said, I am so glad that you've become a Christian. He said, now I don't have to lead singing anymore. And I look at that, and that was disheartening to me. Because he needed to be just as eager to lead singing before and after. There's so much that young people can learn from the aged. And then going back to entrusting in faithful, faithful men. We need to do that. We need to make sure that we get our children around those who are elders in the faith. They've encountered things. They've dealt with things that our children have not. And we know that history is doomed to repeat itself. We need to live faithfully unto death. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence, presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who is the testimony, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Do we pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and steadfastness and gentleness? Is that what we try to pursue in life through the word of God? Fighting the good fight of faith. Or have we backed off because of our age? We're going to let the young people do it now. As I said earlier, there's no retirement age in being a Christian. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 
verses 7 and 8, and this will be our final passage for the evening. Paul says to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Brothers and sisters, are you following the guidepost that lead to heaven? You can answer that if you look in the mirror and you examine yourself. You know the answer, but you know what? God knows the answer as well. And that is a humbling thought. That God knows if we're living the life that we ought to live. You may fool your friends. You may fool fellow Christians. You may fool your children. You may even fool your spouse. But you do not fool the Lord God Almighty. Follow these simple guideposts that will lead us to heaven because I want to be there and I want you to be there with me. I hope this has been a lesson that has been beneficial for you <clears throat> to encourage you to be the Christian that you ought to be to follow God's word, the simplicity of, the God, in God, of God's word, but also to follow the details of God's word. Nothing less and nothing more. Simply God's word. The sermon is yours. If in any way you're subject to the invitation this evening, whether you need to become a Christian, we will help you do that. Right now we'll help you. If you're not living as a Christian ought to live, we will encourage you, we'll lift you up, we'll pray for you, we will help you be the Christian that you ought to be. But you've got to make the first step. If you're subject in any way to the invitation this evening, please come as we stand.